So amino acids put in in order to introduce you to some biochemistry in the A-level. From my perspective, kind of cool because it's the first time that we're treating a series of molecules that has more than one functional group in it. Indeed, amino acids, as the name implies, have both an acid group that you should recognize and then an amine group, hence fourth known as an amino group. Now, before I go any further, I have to emphasize that it's not enough that you come into this module having looked at the carboxylic acid module and the amine module, but you also really do need to have looked at the acid base module because I'm going to be banding around terms like conjugate acid, conjugate base, pKa, pKb, all these other fun things. And if you're not really au fait with the acid base module, you're going to get lost. Okay, so need to be good at acids, the carboxyl a bit, need to be good at bases, the amine bit, and then the physical chemistry as detailed in the acid base module. But anyway, here is our amino acid. We've got a carbon in there that has four things attached to it. A hydrogen, and that hydrogen will always be there as part of the amino acids that we're interested in. The acid group, the amine group, I've already talked about. And then finally, this R group, of course, R standing for the rest of the molecule. Now, accepting the one case where R is H, this carbon is going to have four different things about it, which makes it, of course, a stereogenic carbon or a chiral carbon. And therefore, all amino acids, except the one where R is H, have enantiomers. And that will be something that we come on to extensively in about four movies time. For now, though, I'm going to worry about more the physical chemistry of these things because we have an acid and a base in the same molecule. The acid, of course, can lose the H plus, it can donate the H plus to something else, leaving us here with the conjugate base of the acid group. And a lot of the time we're going to be thinking about this, we're going to focus on here's the acid, here's its conjugate base, and this whole thing here is the rest of the molecule. But of course, the rest of the molecule has this awfully wonderful amine group up here. And amines, of course, can function as bases. That means that they can accept or gain H+. And when they do so, we're going to have their conjugate acid in which this nitrogen has been protonated. And again, there will be a lot of times in which I'm focusing just on the amine end. There is the base end. There is its conjugate acid end. And I'm just going to consider the rest of the molecule interesting as it might be as just a useless appendage when I am talking about the chemistry of the amine group. Now, of course, when you have a molecule that can act as both an acid and as a base, you can call it amphoteric. I prefer calling it amphiprotic because, of course, it's doing both things with a proton, both things with an H plus. One end loses the H plus, the other end can gain the H plus. But amphoteric appears to be the word that you will see the most often. So let's focus on those bits separately, first of all. And I'll start off with thinking about the acid end. This is an acid, which means that when you have it with water, it will donate this proton to the water to make H3O plus and leave behind the conjugate base of the acid. And we described this equilibrium, of course, in terms of the Ka. So the Ka, remember, concentration of H3O plus at equilibrium times the concentration of the conjugate base at equilibrium divided by the concentration of the acid at equilibrium. Now let's think about, as we look at different pH solutions, what's going to happen to this equilibrium? Well, if we're at a very low pH, that means there's an abundance of H3O+. And if there's lots of H3O+, the reaction, the equilibrium, will be pushed towards the left. So when we've got a low pH, we're going to have a lot of the acid form. Conversely, if we put this equilibrium into a high pH environment, well, then that means there's not very much H3O plus in a high pH environment. So that means the equilibrium is going to be moving towards the right to make things better in terms of the equilibrium constant because you don't have very much H3O plus. And so at a high pH situation, you're going to have an awful lot of the conjugate base. Now, I've put this low pH and high pH in quotes because, of course, it's not a very scientific statement, is it? How low is low and how high is high? Well, the answer is that that all depends 
on the Ka. Or more specifically, it depends upon the PKA. Now, remember, when we have P in front of something, it means minus the log of. Well, what's low and what's high is defined by that PKA. If the pH is equal to pKa, we have a 50-50 mixture, an equal mixture of the acid and its conjugate base. And that's true for any old acid situation. You might think back to when we talked about the titrations of weak acids. When we hit the half equivalence point, so we had equal concentrations of the acid and its conjugate base, the pH was the pKa. We also talked about this in terms of buffers. When you have an equal concentration of the acid and its conjugate base, in other words, you have an ideal buffer, well then the pH of that ideal buffer is the pKa. So this is not something you haven't seen before. OK, but very important when applied to amino acids in this discussion we're going to have over these next couple of movies. For each amino acid that we're going to look at, you've got the acid end that has its Ka. When the pH is below the pKa, it's mostly going to be the acid form. When the pH is higher than the pKa, it's mostly going to be in the conjugate base form. Now let's apply that same kind of discussion now, but to the other end, to the amine end, the amino end, the basic end. If we just consider this here, this amino end put in with water, it will accept a proton from the water. That's the proton been accepted from the water, leaving behind the OH minus. And of course we define this equilibrium, we quantify this equilibrium using Kb. And Kb is exactly the same idea. It's the concentration of the conjugate acid here times the OH minus concentration divided by the concentration of the original base. Now, again, let's think of different pH situations. OK, if we have a very high pH situation, very high pH means we don't have very much H3O plus. It means we've got a whole lot of the OH minus. So if we think of this equilibrium in a high pH, the equilibrium is going to be driven back towards the left, towards the basic form. So in high pH, we're going to have the basic form. In low pH, of course, low pH means that we don't have very much OH minus. And so the equilibrium is going to lie over on the right to compensate that. If the equilibrium lies over on the right at the low pH situation, we've got more of the conjugate acid. OK, now again, what is this high versus low? What's the cutoff? Well, it's not the PKB because the pKb, of course, refers to the concentration of OH minus. We don't want the concentration of OH minus, the pOH, we want the pH. So instead of talking about the pKb, we focus instead on the conjugate acid part, and we say that at the pKa that is associated with this conjugate acid part, we have again that 50-50 mixture. So when you look at amino acids, you're not going to be given a Ka and a Kb or a pKa and a pKb. You're going to be given two pKa values. One of those pKa values is going to be associated with the acid part acting as an acid. And the other pKa value is going to be associated not with the amine end acting as a base, but with the conjugate acid of the amine end being an acid. OK, if you think about it too much, it will confuse you. Just think about it just enough to get equilibrium with it. OK, but anyway, very important concepts associated with thinking about the acid end on its own and the base end on its own. But of course, in amino acids, we have both together in the same molecule. So the next couple of movies are where we apply these ideas, but think about putting them together for two simple amino acids.